Amen. If you will, turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. So tonight we are on the 34th miracle uh, of our Lord. We're almost finished with uh, this uh, series on the miracles of Jesus. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to go on Wednesday night. I've not decided which way to go. We, we may look at this. Uh, let me back up just a minute and get ahead of my, myself. My uh, uh, thought process is ahead of my tongue before I can get it all out. But uh, I want to continue on Wednesday nights just looking at the life of Jesus. Uh, I mean, after all, we've got, uh, we've got the Gospels. We've got the, His Word. Uh, and uh, we should study the life of our Lord and learn as much as we can about the life of our Lord. So uh, after this, I'm not sure where we're going. We may look at the parables of Jesus. I think that would be something good to look at. I'm still praying on it. Uh, or we may just look at the sermons uh, of our Lord. Uh, so, uh, But tonight, we're on this 34th uh, miracle, which is just a... It's a wonderful miracle to look at, and I hope I can do it justice tonight as we as we really uh, as we really look at this. So, this is the healing of the high priest servant. It's the healing of the high priest servant in the Garden of Gethsemane, and that servant's name is Malchus. So, let's look at the text, and you'll understand where we're at. Luke twenty-two, verse forty-nine. Uh, Now, let me set the stage. Uh, They're in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas, uh, he and an armed band of men have made their way to the garden with the intent to arrest Jesus. And Judas has, uh, well, the Bible says it twice, two different times Satan entered into him. Uh, And so uh, he is uh, being used of the devil. He had a chance in the upper room. Uh, when the Lord uh, let the disciples know that I'm about to be betrayed and woe to that man who betrays me. So Judas had a chance in the upper room to repent, but his course was already set, greed was in his mind, and Satan had twice entered into him. So Judas and a band of men, they're they're making their way to the garden. They come into the garden and Judas has said, Now, the one that I kiss, that's Jesus. That's the one you need to arrest. Uh, And so they come into the garden, and there is the Lord. There's an an encounter, an exchange of conversation, and Judas kisses the Lord. And then they reach and lay hands on Jesus. So let's see what happens. Luke 22, 49. When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. And then Jesus said unto the chief priests and certain of the temple and the elders which were come to him, uh, Be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staffs? When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Uh, and so, uh, so there's that miracle. So they, they come into the garden. Judas betrays Jesus. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of funny as we read about Peter here. Peter is the one that cut off Malchus, the high priest's servant, his ear. Uh, now, all, this, this, uh, this story is recorded in all four Gospels. So to get the whole picture, go read all four Gospel accounts. Luke, however, is the only one that records the healing of that ear. See, Luke is a physician. I don't know if you remember that or not, but he is a physician. That's why when you read the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, you're going to see details Fine details. He doesn't just write in general, or he doesn't just write in black and white or even gray. Uh, But as a good physician would do, he pays attention to the small stuff, to details. And so, of course, he would be the one, the only gospel writer, that records the healing uh, of Malchus, his ear. 
Uh, but it's so interesting, we see, a, we get a little picture of, of Peter in this picture, of Simon Peter, because uh, we see the disciples say, Lord, shall we pull out our swords and our knives? Uh, and it is as if they don't even have that out of their mouth when Peter he has already drawn his sword uh, and he makes a swing at Malchus, the servant of the high priest. Now we've talked about how Peter is headlong, uh, how oftentimes his mouth is shaped like his foot because he opens it, he sticks his foot in his mouth. Uh, we've talked about how brash he is. We've talked about how that he... He doesn't think, he simply responds and he reacts to emotion. Uh, when, and we learn from that, that we don't need to respond and react to emotion immediately, that we need to use our brain to begin with and let the Spirit temper our thoughts, think through things. But Peter didn't do that. He just, he just simply responded. Uh, and so we can learn from that. On the other hand, I, I, I do admire Peter because at least he was a man of action. Uh, right or wrong, he was going to do something. He didn't just sit around uh, and do nothing. Uh, but So the disciples look around, they're like, Lord, they're betraying you, they've come, they're armed, should we pull out swords and knives and should we, should we fight? And before they even get the question out, Peter's already drawn his sword, he makes a, a, he makes a swarp at uh, Malchus and uh, he cuts his ear off. Uh, and so... Uh, and then we see the healing of Jesus. Jesus heals that ear. Uh, so a couple of things we need to look at. You need to know that this is the last uh, of the 16 healing miracles. Remember, out of these 35, 36 miracles, however you want to count those, uh, 16 are actually healing miracles. Uh, and this is the last of those 16 healing mir miracles. Also, this is the last miracle before Calvary. Uh, this is the last miracle before uh, Jesus uh, makes his way uh, to the cross. Uh, it's also, just in way of some side notes, it's the only miracle that is uh, performed, excuse me, on an enemy. All the other miracles that we see, they're generally performed on people who are seeking Jesus, who are, want, who, who are wanting to be helped by Jesus, who have heard of Jesus, and they're putting their faith in Christ. This is the only miracle we see that is performed on an enemy. There's a lesson there in that, a lesson on grace uh, from, uh, from our Lord. And uh, let me say this just in way of that. The best thing you can do for those who consider yourselves, those who consider themselves your enemy, I know you love everybody and you don't have enemies, but there's people that may not like you. Uh, and they would consider themselves your enemy. The best thing you can do for them is, of course, pray for them, absolutely, uh, but also is just to love them. Uh, and I assure you that, that that's better than any revenge that you could ever get on someone who calls themselves your enemy, is to pray for them uh, and to love them, because that's what we see uh, our Lord do here. Three things we learn from this miracle. Number one, if you go read the other gospel accounts, I don't believe uh, it's, it's not in this account here, but if you go read several of them, I think maybe Matthew and, and Mark list it. Maybe John does too. Uh, but one of the things where you're going to see is you're going to see uh, a little known role of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's little known, but it is so, so important. Uh, so we learn from the other writers as they write about this uh, passage. So what Jesus says to his disciples when they say, hey, uh, should we pull out our sword and our knives? And Peter takes his out and he actually puts it into action, cuts off the ear of the high priest, Malchus. Uh, and our Lord says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Put, put all that away and stop right now. He says, look, I, I, don't, I don't need you doing that for me. Uh, he says, in fact, he said, all I had to do was say the word and I would have had 12 legions of angels here defending me and fighting for me. That's 72,000 angels that he could have called just at a thought to defend himself. So what this little, uh, this little known or often overlooked role that Jesus has is, is that he is the supreme commander of all of heaven's armies. In fact, uh, the Old Testament, he is called the captain of the Lord's host. Uh, and so uh, we see that as the captain of the Lord's host, the Lord's host is all of heaven's armies. 
all of the angels uh, in heaven. Uh, and, uh, and so Jesus says, look, he says, at any moment I could have called and had 12 legions of angels come and rescue me from this whole entire situation. They would have fought for me and I wouldn't have had to fought at all. But I didn't. And I want you to notice that he did not. And the reason he did not is because uh, he come uh, not, uh, as we study this, we, we, we see that he came uh, to die for sinful man, not to destroy sinful man. And boy, I want to tell you, there's, there's some preaching out there today that makes you think that Jesus is out to destroy all of us because we're nothing but sinners who can't save ourselves, and God is angry at us because we're sinners. And, and if you just listen to, so to that kind of preaching, you'll be convinced that, that the Lord is just wanting to destroy us. But I want to tell you something. God is gracious and God is merciful. And here he could, here he could have called uh, 72,000 angels to fight and defend him uh, and his disciples against uh, all of these armed individuals, but he didn't do it. Why? Because he came to die for sinful man, not destroy sinful man. And he knew he had a purpose. He came for this end. He knew this was his time. What was that end? And what was his time? Well, his time was to die on the cross for my sins and your sins and the sins of all the world so that all the world could be saved if they would only turn to him. Uh, by faith, through repentance, through repentance and faith. And he was not going to let anything stop him uh, from making his way to the cross. And he knew that this was part of the process or part of the journey. So he didn't stop it by calling legions, 12 legions of angels, uh, but he allowed it to take place. So number one, you need to remember this. It's an often overlooked uh, important role of Jesus, and that is, is that he's a ca the captain of the Lord's host. In other words, he is the supreme commander of all of heaven's armies. So we learn that from this text. But I do want you to notice also this as we, as we look through and, uh, and we see what happens here. So uh, I want you to notice... Peter's reaction. Peter's reaction is the way Peter usually reacted, uh, at least until he was restored there by the Sea of Galilee after the resurrection in the post-resurrection of Jesus. But before that, Peter was very much a fleshly believer. Uh, so he was a disciple of Jesus. In fact, he was the right-hand man of our Lord. In fact, he was the best friend of Jesus. If our Lord had a best friend upon this earth, it was Simon Peter. But you're going to find when you study the life of Simon Peter that, that, well, he was a disciple. Now stay with me because this is you and I. He was a disciple. He believed in the Lord. He loved the Lord. He followed the Lord. Uh, there were times when he was completely sold out and he was full of the Spirit and he was exactly what the Lord called him to be. There were times when he was like that. And then, well, there were a whole lot of times when even though he was that man who loved the Lord, followed the Lord, cherished the Lord, clung to the Lord, pled his allegiance to the Lord, even though he was that man, there were a lot of times when, boy, he sure did act in the flesh. He really got in the flesh. And so I really don't expect an acknowledgement from you on this, but I think that's kind of like you and I, believers today. We, we love the Lord. We're, we're disciples of the Lord. We worship the Lord. We cherish the Lord. And sometimes we're so in the Spirit. We do what the Lord wants us to do, but, there, but there's a lot of times, but there's a lot of times we just get in the flesh. We do things without thinking them through. We say things without thinking them through, and so forth. Well, that was the case with Simon Peter. And so, number two, what he does is, is, is very important for us to learn, is Simon Peter in this, this, uh, this text, in this story, he, uh, he fights the wrong enemy with the wrong weapon. So you remember the Lord had tried to show them this, and he had tried to instruct uh, them in this. In fact, he has to reinforce this after Peter draws his sword and cuts the ear off of Malchus, the servant of the high priest, 
That's why the Lord says, uh, now is it's, it's now it's time. The power of darkness is is going to get to have their way temporarily, just for a small moment. Uh, and so he has to reinforce this. But Simon, he tries to fight a spiritual battle with earthly means, and he uses the wrong weapon uh, on the wrong enemy. Remember, the Bible teaches us that we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And, and so one of the conversations I've been having uh, recently with several different people, actually, is, is that, and you need to remember this, is that when you're a believer, you have to put your entire life under the umbrella of spiritual warfare. Okay? Everything in your life, and I do mean everything. I mean everything spiritual, everything physical, everything you can touch, lay your hands on, everything you see, everything you smell, everything you hear. As a believer, you have to put your entire life under the umbrella of spiritual warfare. You have to do that. Now, I don't believe that, uh, again, let me stress this, I don't believe there's a booger behind every bush. Let me say it where you can understand it. I don't believe there's a demon behind every bush. I'm not, I'm not that extreme or charismatic. Uh, I'm not going to walk out uh, in my, uh, to go to my truck here in a little while. It's got a flat tire, and I'm going to say, oh, my goodness, the devil flattened my tire. He's out to get me. It's spiritual warfare. No, it could be just that the guys that put on my vinyl siding were very careless and they left nails all around my garage and my sunroom. And uh, one of them finally got blew into the driveway out of the grass from my mower and I ran over it with my truck. So it didn't have nothing to do with the devil. It had everything to do with the guy who did my vinyl siding, not picking up all the nails that, the, that they left. Uh, and so I don't believe that there's a devil behind every bush. But what I do know and what I am certain of is that as a believer, we have to put our whole life under the umbrella of spiritual warfare. And we've got to remember that we don't battle against flesh and blood. Listen, we've got to, we've got to remember that our, our, our battle is not between me and you. It's, it's not between you and a neighbor that you're having a battle with or a coworker that you're having a, or a classmate you're having a battle with, whatever the case may be, or you and a child or you and a husband or you and a wife or whatever the case may be. No, no, we battle not against flesh and blood, uh, but against uh, principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. What does all that mean? That just, that's just the ranking of demons and hell's army. Uh, they have a rank and file system. They have battalions, they have companies, they have platoons, they have squads, squad leaders, platoon leaders. They have people that rank over uh, all of that. Hell's, armies, Hell's army does. And so what Peter failed to realize is, hey, this is not a physical war to be fought with tools of the trade in this physical world. I can't fight this battle with a sword I hold in my hand that's made out of metal and it's sharp on both sides. No. Uh, and Jesus reminded him of that, that we battle not against flesh and blood. We battle not against flesh and blood. We battle not against flesh and blood. Yes, the devil uses people to attack us many times. He uses people to cause trouble in our lives. He uses people to disrupt the church. He uses people to destroy the church even. And we have to recognize that. Uh, but the battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the forces of darkness. And so Peter, he attempted to fight the, uh, the wrong enemy with the wrong weapon. And what he should have done was because our Lord had already given this example, he should have fought the enemy with the word of God. But he had been so busy running his mouth during the ministry of Jesus when he should have been being a little more silent, taking more in of the teachings of the Lord because the Lord had taught them and prepared them for this day. In fact, the Lord had told him, watch this, the Lord had told him over and over, I'm going to be arrested at the hands of angry men. I'll be crucified, but on the third day I'll rise again. And did you know that none of those disciples remembered that at all? They all forgot it, and they should have remembered it. Maybe if Peter hadn't have been talking, he would have took some in and had the word of God and in the garden when he saw this happen, and he could have said, wait a minute, 
I'll battle this with the word of God because our Lord said that he's going to be arrested at the hands of angry men. He's going to be crucified. And on the third day, he's going to rise again. This is part of God's plan. But he didn't do that. And so he tried to fight the wrong enemy with uh, the, wrong, the wrong weapon. So number one, I want you to learn from this miracle that Jesus, that he is the commander, the supreme commander of heaven's armies. Write that down. He is responsible for every angel in heaven and assigning them and sending them where believers need help. That's what they do. Uh, and we, we're not going to talk about the ministry of angels. Maybe we'll do that one, one Wednesday night. But anyway, so number two, uh, Peter here, he fought the wrong enemy with the wrong weapon, teaching us our battle's not against flesh and blood, uh, but it's against the forces of darkness and all of hell, and we battle it with the Word of God. That's why it hurts my heart to know that so many believers that occupy our pews on Sunday mornings, that they don't take the Word of God more serious, nor count it more precious, nor do they go into God's Word and find gold nuggets, gold nugget verses that they can memorize, write down, put on a refrigerator, put on their steering wheel, whatever, and that is their verse in spiritual warfare. Listen, when the enemy is hounding you and on you, you need a verse to cling to. You need a verse that you can turn to. Because listen to me, in a time of warfare, when you're being beat down and when you're being oppressed and when you're being tried, listen, trying to remember what I said is not going to help you unless you're trying to remember what I've said from straight from God's Word. Trying to remember what that funny little Instagram quote is that that uh, Instagram... TV preacher has left on there. Listen, that's not you need you need the word of God. You need something to battle with. And we do that with the word of God. And so lastly, I want you to just notice how Jesus shows such grace. Now, I want you to kind of keep in mind that this miracle as we're reading about it, it's not this huge flashy miracle. It's not a crowd-related miracle. Remember where they were bringing all the sick to Jesus and he was healing them all? Imagine how big that would be. If all the sick in Franklin County were coming to Liberty Baptist Church and Jesus was standing right here at the altar or out there on the, on the, the steps of the church and all the sick in Franklin County were being brought to Jesus, we're bringing friends, family, we're going to St. Mary's Hospital in Livonia, we're bringing sick out of there, bringing them to our Lord, and as the crowds arrive, Jesus is speaking or touching whatever he did and he heals them all. Wow, what a flashy miracle. What a flashy miracle. Twelve men in a boat. They're about to sink and go under. They're experienced sailor, sailors and fishermen. They know how to sail the high seas. They've done everything they can do. They can't save themselves. They're convinced they're drowning. They cry. And the master comes walking on the, wind, uh, walking on the sea, calming the wind and the waves. What a, what a flashy miracle. What an attention getter. Or as he comes upon lepers, he heals those lepers and they've never been any healed and, and, and they're so diseased and it's so permanent, but our Lord heals that, mir heals that leprosy. These are big miracles. These are huge things. What about where he raises a dead son? Uh, what about where, uh, where he heals blind men? I mean, the things our Lord has done, it's, it's, it's headline worthy. But this one is not really headline worthy. Peter cuts off Malchus, the high priest's ear. Jesus picks it up and heals it. But imagine this. Just go into, the, let your mind, the details are not all there, but we can kind of know how this goes. The Bible's very, very clear that, that Peter, he, he was probably intending on cutting the head off of this uh, servant of the high priest, uh, but his aim was bad. And he cuts the guy's ear off. Okay? Not just cut his ear, but the text and the wording is very, very clear. He cut his ear off. Now, I'm not real sure how I would respond to this. But I'm pretty certain if my ear was cut off and your ear was cut off and we watched it fall to the ground, we feel the pain... We feel the blood coursing down our neck. 
I, I'm pretty sure that no one in here is going to say, well, well, praise Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You're probably going to be screaming. I've seen grown men scream. I've seen grown men cry from injuries. Uh, and so to have your ear cut off and it land on the ground, this is a pretty dramatic type thing. I, I remember we were at the beach one year. And right on the beach, well, preachers don't go to the beach. We were at the ocean. I, I got I to be Simon. Or I, I got to be Peter. I can't be Simon or Simon Peter. So preachers don't go to the beach. They go to the ocean. We were at the ocean. We were sitting on by the ocean. And this little boy, 12 years old or whatever, he's out there playing around. And Elizabeth's about 12, 13, 14, whatever. And uh, all of a sudden, this little boy starts screaming, and he starts running out of the water. And I'm thinking Jaws has just attacked this boy. Well, he comes, he's crying. He's just, just crying like you wouldn't believe. He gets just out of the water, and he falls down onto the ground, and he's pulling himself up toward the lifeguard stand, dragging himself, and he's just crying, and he's just wailing. And I don't see any visible blood at all, so I, I'm like, <laughs> and he's like, I just got stung by a jellyfish. And, I, I'm, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. The end of the world. And I was telling the girls, don't worry, he's, he's good. They get him up there, they put vinegar on it. I'm like, drama queen, drama queen. Well, so Elizabeth goes out, she's riding the boogie board right after that. Turns out it wasn't a jellyfish. Turns out it was a Portuguese man of war. And it wraps itself around her legs, completely around both legs. And for years after that, for years, she had scars that looked like whelks that went all the way around both of her legs for years. And so she come out crying, and I'm like, suck it up, buttercup. It's just a little jellyfish thing. Get over it. Uh, and when she come up there, she had a pretty severe reaction to it. And so I realized that it was a lot more serious than what it initially looked like. Well, listen, this right here, this is serious. This is a serious deal. His ear is cut off, detached from his head. It falls to the ground. But watch what Jesus does. This is his enemy. And chances are there was such a crowd in the garden that night that many people there probably didn't even know what our Lord did. But our Lord showed grace in that when that ear was cut off, he simply reached down, picked it up, reached up and put it right back on that man's head and he healed that man. And that's all that was said about it. That's all we see recorded about it. Jesus picked his ear up, put it on the side of his face, healed him, and then the events went on. Chances are a crowd that size and a crowd that violent, a mob ready to grab him and arrest him. Some of those folks didn't even know what had happened. Maybe if you were on in the back or whatever. Maybe you were a lookout. I don't know what the case was. But this man was nevertheless part of a mob that, well, was considered themselves enemies of Jesus. But look what our Lord did. He showed grace. I often wonder how different the world would be if we, if just we as believers, if everyone who says they were, they were believers, if we would show grace to people around us, to people we deal with every day. You know, sometimes some of the meanest people I've ever been around since I've been walking with the Lord, it's been believers. It's not been unbelievers, but some of the meanest, most rudest, most short-tempered people I've ever been around have been believers. And it's kind of ironic because we as believers, we've been shown such grace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Every single one of us, we don't deserve the grace that he's given us, whether he saved you off of a church pew or he saved you off of a bar stool. He's nevertheless give us all the same amount of grace. And what an example to us that every day that, that we need to show grace. In fact, listen, you can write this down because it's going to be true what I'm about to say. There are going to be people who will do the wrong things towards you. 
There's going to be people who will say the wrong things towards you or about you. There's going to be people who don't like you and who hate you and who demonstrate that towards you sometimes every day. You're going to cross paths with people like that in life. There's going to be people, and I don't get this, I honestly do not get it at all, but there's going to be people who, who have ill will towards you and they act out of spite. And, and I don't know what spite is. I, I think the definition of spite in my book would be that you plan on doing harm or ill will towards somebody where you actually take time to plan that and then you're spiteful in that process, there's going to be people who do that stuff. You can guarantee that's going to happen. Not everybody is going to love you nor kiss you on the cheek. And some that kiss you on the cheek are betraying you and are, you, are your enemy. The Lord already said that in Proverbs. He said, faithful are the wounds of a friend, uh, but the enemy, well, he kisses you. And that's what happened here with our Lord. But you can write all that down. That's going to happen. There's going to be people like that. You can write it down. They're going to say things to you to hurt you. They're going to do things to hurt you. But also write this down. How did our Lord respond to his enemy? He responded with grace. Such, such grace. I know it's not natural. And I don't know about you, but in the natural man, I'm a fighter. In the natural man, I'm not going to be pushed around. In the natural man, you're not going to speak wrong to me. In the natural man, I'm going to deal with it. In the natural man, I'm going to handle things. But see, the Lord has saved me. So I can't live in the natural man anymore or the fleshly man anymore. I have to live as a spirit-filled man. And so as a spirit-filled man, what I have to do is, is I have to show the same grace that our Lord showed. I, I told you Sunday morning about a man who who caused much, much trouble for me for, for a couple years in ministry. But I'll never forget one night we left the service, and listen, heaven had fell that night. And I think there might have even been a couple people saved and people all over the altar weeping and crying. God was just truly moving. And I don't remember how we wound up there, but we wound up kind of at a side door in the, toward the back of the church, and he was leaving and, and uh, I was still there, I guess maybe locking up, whatever. <clears throat> and he, he was so angry. He was so mad that night. He was wanting me to leave, and I wasn't leaving, and God was just blessing. And he was so, so angry, and his face was red. The veins on his neck was sticking out. And I honestly, I thought in my mind, he's going to have a stroke. In fact, he did have a stroke just a couple weeks after this, but... I thought, he's going to have a stroke right here in my face. And by God's Spirit, and you hear me when I say this, because I don't want you to think I'm bragging on me. You, we need to be very clear about this. But by God's Spirit in me, I was able to look that man in the eyes that night, and I called him by name while he was just berating me. And I called him by name, and I said, Mr. What's his name? I love you. And when I said that, his face got redder and he got madder. I for sure thought he would stroke out right then. And he kept on for just a minute and I said it again. I called him by name and said, I'm telling you, I love you. And he turned and he went out the door. And I, I hope my reaction would always be that way. And it should be if I stay spirit filled. But there's a lesson our Lord teaches here that we need to learn. And that is that we are to be gracious to people around us, both unsaved and saved. Our Lord's been so gracious. Listen, He's been so gracious to me. The grace He's given me, I couldn't ever tell you about. And the grace He's given me, I don't even know all about it. I just know I don't deserve what I have. I don't deserve salvation. And I don't deserve Him to be my Savior but he is out of grace and mercy. And so in turn, I have to turn around and give that same grace to a world around me because I've been a recipient of it and I want the world to know it. And in ultimately doing so, what we're doing is, is we're pointing people to Jesus. We're pointing people to a Savior 
who has all grace for every man, woman, boy, and child on the face of this planet. If you...